All right, so um, I forgot to record class number 10. So I will start out this pre-class video for class number 11 by uh, summarizing what the students said in class number 10. Uh, mostly we talked about the second paper and we started in on the assignment about humanism, which again was assigned on Friday. So your requirement for Tuesday, we're, we're going to start out finishing up with anybody who hasn't presented on paper number one, who's finally finished paper number one. And then we'll get into the assignment on different kinds of humanism and the, the students who didn't have a chance to, to report in then. Then we'll do the comments on the reading for um, Monday, which was letter from a Birmingham jail. We'll talk about Martin Luther King Jr. And then for today, for Tuesday, we'll talk about um, Black Lives Matter and humanism. There's a article that I want you to read. And I said in the stream that that's the number one article I want to make sure everyone reads. Then there was an attachment called humanism and anti humanism. And that's 18 pages. But the first 13 pages are just about the humanist manifestos not 1933, 1973, 2000 that I already assigned earlier. You can scroll through them if you like, but page 14 to 17 is uh, this huge anti-humanist um, article. So just to give you an idea of the kinds of toxic things that people are reading, um, the way that anti-humanists demonize humanists and some humanists will demonize fundamentalist Christians, whatever, but it's not helpful. <laughs> it undermines democracy. And in general, I blame the intellectuals because they ought to be the grown-ups in the room because they are educated and privileged. And so one of the responsibilities of being educated, you have to have natural ability, you have to have opportunity and motivation, and then you get this high level of education. You, were, you did not control the fact that you had natural ability and you did not control the fact that you had opportunity. Uh, your parents structured their life so that you would get motivation and opportunity. Sometimes people can create their own opportunities, uh, but most of the time, especially now, because college costs a lot of money, um, those opportunities have not been completely uh, created by you. And then uh, motivation. So again, you are motivated, but a kid in a family can get uh, demonized or become the black sheep and lose motivation for some reason long before they have any idea of the cost of it. So I do think that once you get a college education, you're responsible for not polarizing, not oversimplifying. And it's particularly annoying to me that PhDs will do it and PhDs in philosophy, which I think is especially annoying. <laughs> uh, but there was an article I read by a woman who, who the title of it was philosophy as blood sport. So philosophers are trained to think clearly so that they can, they are, can easily spot 
unclear thinking, they can easily, you know, put on all the logical fallacy labels and explain how the thinking violates six logical fallacies. I can do that, but you, you choose to build a bridge between people or you choose to label and demonize people. Those are choices and um, your training doesn't require you to be nasty. <laughs> um, so I, I wanna start out by saying, I do think it's really important. And I think the students first papers, uh, lots of them were related to issues that I think, you know, show that Lyon College is, is uh, got a lot of people who can move the country forward. Um, so Titus, his paper was about humanism and religion. He said they're both useful, but it's better to put humanism first. And then what is humanism? First of all, we rely on ourselves as opposed to waiting for divine intervention. Because if you're waiting for God to come and help you out, you might miss an opportunity. Secondly, you focus on what is in your control so that you can actually achieve your destiny. And third, you, you have fewer excuses and you hold yourself accountable you don't blame God because so many of these things are not God's fault. They're caused by human choices. Climate change, for example, which Titus didn't mention, but climate change is not God's plan or God's fault. We have known, we have reason, we have known for centuries that this could happen. We've known for 70 years that it is happening. We've chosen to ignore it because we've chosen greed. We've chosen billionaires, making people making billions on fossil fuels. We've allowed them to control our political process. We've allowed them to control the political rhetoric. Those things are choices, human choices. We shouldn't blame God, but Titus had different examples in his mind, I'm sure. Um, the advantages of religion, that there's less stress in situations that you really can't control, and you can continue to trust in the future. Um, and then also people, it's clear to people that human systems are unreliable and unjust. So it's always inspiring and somewhat comforting to think there's a higher power that does follow the golden rule. And then people have a community, a church community to go to um, with people with a common worldview and that makes them feel not alone. Um, so uh, Mary Hannah responded, Michael responded, um, what, I, what I mentioned was that actually our founding fathers cherished the union of reason and faith. They, that's why they started these small liberal arts colleges, and that was the foundation of those colleges, because they did not want, if people split religion from reason, they're going to... Um, be suckers. They can be manipulated by political rhetoric that claims where a politician claims he or she is doing God's will and people will believe it. And our founders did not want that. That's what they had in Europe. And so our founders actually put the humanist part first. And we'll see that later when we read Confucianism because um, Benjamin Franklin and other founders really emphasized the virtues. Even if Confucius said them, um, they, they cared about virtue clubs and people coming together to cultivate virtue. 
more than just to cultivate a belief in God, which doesn't always lead to virtue. It can lead to intolerance. Okay, so Mary Hannah, her paper was on leadership and management. She was thinking of coaching, the importance of equal treatment of the players, applying the rules the best. She also talked about her mother um, as a teacher and the importance of listening and communicating um, and, and um, acknowledging that people learn differently and, um, and in any position of authority, we always need people who will use that authority for the well-being of the people over whom they have it. Um, and the other point she made was that we are always role models. And so we should always think that uh, we're being watched. Again, in college, starting in college, that's important because you're probably a role model for your younger siblings or just in general for younger people who look up to college students. Um, okay, so, so Jason talked about stress and depression and how he quoted from Newland about the balance, the natural homeostasis in our Psycho in our psychophysical um, way that we're wired, that it's the product of a long uh, history of evolution. And um, we, we get homeostasis. And then um, he said that institutions benefit from humanism. When people can develop this homeostasis, it follows what has naturally evolved, so you're actually healthier. And then you can run, create institutions and run institutions where the people creating them know how to create homeostasis. They know how to maintain it in the, in the application of the rules of the institution. They can just keep the system going. Um, and he also emphasized the importance of childhood habituation. So from the time you're young, it's important to, to constantly cultivate this kind of flourishing homeostasis. Um, Trey wrote also about who is a leader and you should, a leader always treats people equally and is trust, trustworthy and reliable. And his role model was Martin Luther King Jr. Um, who never gave up, right? He didn't let himself be um, degraded or ignored. Um, and, and also um, he always treated everyone equally with equal respect. We're all children in the eyes of God. We're all equally capable of flourishing um, and that Everyone in a position of authority should treat people equally apart from their skill base or their race, or as a teacher, apart from, you know, who's excelling in the class more than somebody else. Um, I usually don't have to worry about that too much, but especially in this class, I think everybody who comes to class is pretty engaged. So it's not gonna be a problem, I hope. Um, I hope I don't end up favoring or appearing to favor students in this class because that would be particularly egregious since uh, there's absolutely no reason for it. Um, so Michael talked about the connection between social stress and social and political, between personal stress and social and political life. So he talked about social media that creates stress and it more than necessary. I think it's crazy that people would use their phones and, and the phones are designed to trigger fear, a fear response. 
they they want to get you hooked on that little buzzer or, or bell or whatever it is and get you running to your phone but that's a stress response and so i think it's crazy like the, there's enough to worry about in life why would you add to that i don't understand it but it's definitely true and then um in political stress um that's another big problem that people you might have people you're friends with you get along just fine but then when it comes to politics everything gets polarized and um it's polarizing the relation between the generations and um again that political rhetoric is based on fantasies and phobias deliberately right which is that most instinctual drives and so if you keep triggering those instinctual drives you're going to break down all this higher order reflective thinking and and you're going to go to a much more primitive level of both the way an individual operates and the way social life operates and the way political life operates um caitlin talked about um management and she said she brought in an experience she had from about six months ago uh, but she said she wouldn't talk about it too much because it's so negative but um she did understand right looking through aristotle's list that all of those things are important for being a good leader and um the the thing that came to mind the most being high-minded not petty and keeping your priorities straight keeping your focus on your goals and if you are a bad leader the best employees leave and the only ones that are left are the ones that can't get a better job and they will not do any more than they have to do they won't go the second mile and they won't do any better quality of work than they absolutely have to to keep their jobs and of course a bad employer might have to keep them even if they mess up because no one else is going to work for them so you know it's like karma there's a feedback loop if you treat your employees poorly you're going to get poor employees um Lekesny talked about his summer job and how he's playing a leadership role it's a job of community developed job development he's a site manager and he works with kids in a summer camp and so i was just pointing out that yeah I, my kids um we were like a block and a half from a community center and there was a lot of that kind of those kind of programs going on and i really like those programs and they get labeled socialism but they're right they're very inexpensive per person i don't know less than a dollar if you if everybody puts in a quarter or 50 cents then all the neighborhood kids can have these programs um and they're based on the belief that if we want to have a good democracy we have to invest in children and we have to teach them how to rule and be ruled we have to make sure they get an environment where there's a mentor, a role model, and then they're playing, you know, they're doing summertime activities, but not just randomly or chaotically or um, unsupervised, that there's somebody there and the person is paid to help them develop their character, but it's also for the sake of preserving a high level of social and political life where we all have skin in the game it matters to all of us that everyone else is getting raised to uh be mature right and to think about each other all right so that was what we oh yeah and then the different kinds of humanism mary hannah talked about humanistic parenting and she used her mother as an example um so she interviewed her mother and her mother focused on 
the importance of forgiveness and uh, friendship. She has four kids who are all going different routes in life. And that's okay, because kids are different. Um, and so <laughs> I didn't mention it in class, but of course I'm a mother. So yeah, I thought about those things a lot when I was younger. And it does matter. I think um, students should figure out that their parents did have a philosophy while they were being raised. The parents might not even be that conscious of it or that deliberate about it, but it's there, right? Um, some children grow up in a culture where their parents treat them as if they're born sinners. They want to do what's wrong because it's wrong and they have to get sort of whipped into shape. And other children like in Confucius, in Confucius, and we will see this, get raised on the assumption that all people are by nature good. So all the parents do is just, you know, treat them as if they're self-controlled, as if they're, they want to help each other. And it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, Aristotle said, children are, are born neither good nor evil and they have to get raised to be, to seek virtue. Um, all right, and then Caitlin talked about humanistic psychology and the goal of humanistic psychology <coughs> is self-actualization. So I talked a little bit about if you think of yourself as your mind and you think of your true self as exercising all those virtues, um, then humanistic psychology won't degenerate into what it can degenerate into, which is, <clears throat> let's see, if, so, well, somebody can just uh, have positive self-regard and be a pretty narrow, self-absorbed person. They can be narcissistic, but they call it positive self-regard. So of course that's not what the humanists meant, but it but they didn't say that. They said, you know, you just help people feel better. Well, so people come to psychologists because something's wrong. They've been wounded. And so on, you know, an Aristotelian model, they have been treated inappropriately. So they are more self-loathing self-denigrating than they really should be. It's not appropriate. So the therapist helps them develop a sense of self that's accurate, right? It's not your fault. You got wounded. That's not your fault. You really aren't like that. Then when you get to some level where you can see yourself for who you are, then you can start saying, oh, okay, so I'm a human being, but I can still act virtuously or wickedly, right? Just like anybody else, as long as it's a level table for starters. Otherwise, um, there's a positive psychology movement that just aims at deluding people, you know, make, making people feel deluded about who they are or about how important, I mean, and it gets carried over into my country is the best and, or my country's fine. Like you shouldn't criticize, like you shouldn't criticize me, you shouldn't criticize my country, whatever. Um, so if people decide they have positive self-regard, but that's not critically examining, you know, you can make mistakes they might end up wounding other people in exactly the way they were wounded because now they don't think less of themselves for anything they do. So I think humanist psychology is good for healing wounds and then it has to be a more robust view of humanity based on our capacity for good and evil. Um, all right. So that was what we covered in class number 10. And 
what were the material for class number 11 is, let me go to oops, here. Is Martin Luther King and um, I did a pre-class video for class number 10. So I think um, you can just look at that one. You probably have already looked at it, but I will also do this long um, outline, which I didn't have on the pre-class video, but um, I just look at all the ways the Bible can be used to, has been used, of course, to justify slavery, but it really isn't the spirit of the Bible. And um, I think we can all agree at this point that the best interpretation of Christianity, especially, but Judaism also, is to, um, is to treat everyone as equal. There's a tradition of nonviolent resistance. Jesus started it, right? Uh, there's Amos. There are the um, the prophets way before, yeah, Moses, Aaron, uh, Amos, Moses. Yeah, there's a lot of prophets in the Old Testament. Then the Jesus and Paul and the early Christians. It just goes on and on. So Socrates was like this. He knew he was getting into trouble. Um, Aristotle, how you can apply Aristotle to the civil rights movement, how you can apply Seneca, Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas. And these are all things that Martin Luther King Jr. incorporated in his letter from a Birmingham jail. So he had read all this material. So he, he, he knows what he's doing. He knows where he got the stuff that he said. It didn't come straight out of his head. Um, and then he gives, you know, his arguments for why he's doing what he's doing. Um, so I think, I think it's a classic document. It really touches on the basic foundation of American democracy or of any democracy. So there are societies all around the world that have used King's model for nonviolent civil resistance. Um, they're using it now. Russia has a dissident, dissident, a movement of people who disagree. And Belarus, I think that's what it's called. But some of these old countries that used to be controlled by the USSR, um, Russia is now trying to uh, pet. There are rulers that are friends with Putin that are um, acting in really authoritarian ways. And there are movements to resist that. And they do engage in a lot of the same behaviors, the same training, the same uh, plan, strategy. Um, okay, and so, and so again, I've already done a, a video on that. It's about half an hour long. So then the one for Tuesday's class, what I wanna emphasize is humanism and Black Lives Matter. So this is just a continuation of what Martin Luther King said 50 plus years ago, but just to show that you're updating humanism, you're applying humanism to this recent movement. Um, my particular you know, orientation is to think that we basically are still driven by pleasure and fear. We still have that main problem of reverting to a more primitive level of human existence. That's our main task is to keep moving forward and upward and not allow 
pleasure and fear and survival instinct to um, lead us down a very dark path of violence, and, which includes fantasies. A lot of what you see with your eyeballs is violence is motivated by somebody's fantasy about, well, if we just kill off this people, we can all have peace and justice and all this. I mean, there's some fantasy in there that, you know, unless you ask somebody, it sure doesn't look like that. It looks like, uh, you know, genocide or something, nothing very pretty. Anyway, but we can, we're driven by those things, pleasure and fear, fantasies and phobias. And we have to constantly work against that. Um, but this, the intrinsic value of humanism is at the core of all social justice movements, including Black Lives Matter. So we have the Black Humanist Alliance and um, you can read that. You can check out this, the sites they refer to if you like to, but I would like you to read this and just to make sure to read just these first couple pages. After that, there are uh, documents about political, um, in 2020, the kind of political messages that were um, being sent. So, um, well, I do think you should read about this abusive police practices, um, police killings. I, the George Floyd, the decision was just made, I don't know, a month ago. I live in Minneapolis now, right? So I was eating at a restaurant um, and I had, I got out of the restaurant into the car and I turned the radio on. That was right when the judge was making, that was sentencing. Uh, Derek uh, Chauvin, anyway, whatever his name was, the police officer. And so he got 22 and a half years, which was sort of in between the minimum and the maximum, slightly closer to the minimum. Um, and so those are, these are much more recent events. But if you read this, I, you should tie it back to those St. Augustine, St. Thomas, Socrates, Aristotle, just so you can see that the Western tradition is very much in favor of this kind of social justice. And so I am the most traditionalist maybe the most traditionalist person on campus, but nobody would think that, right? Um, because of the way that liberals have gotten labeled as radical extremists, you know, not American, not patriotic, not religious, not authentic Americans. And that is just absolutely not true. Not true. I mean, they might disagree with the founders, but they can't tell me that the founders were conservative Christians because they weren't, uh, blind patriots because they weren't, they declared war on their country, um, narrow-minded, my way or the highway because they weren't, you know, and against social justice, no, I mean, <laughs> That's why they had a revolution was based on social justice, equality and freedom. So Martin Luther King is a radical conservative. Professor Beck is a radical conservative. So, <laughs> so let's, let's think about the power of political rhetoric. Rhetoric driven by the desire to get votes that completely distorts a country's history and um, the truth. I mean, it's very serious. Um, okay, so let's all read, um, read this document um, and what they're recommending. 
I also have a 25 page document on qualified immunity and the history behind that. And I will, anyone who wants to read it, I've got it. I've got a long document on housing problems for African Americans and why it's so difficult for them to accumulate wealth because they can't get houses with mortgages that include um, paying on the principal and building equity in neighborhoods where the value of the house goes up. And that's the source, a major source of a family's wealth. And so middle-class family's wealth. If you're denied the opportunity for that, you're, you're not gonna have nearly as much wealth. Okay. So the next thing is um, what happened with the HEROES Act right after COVID that Betsy DeVos, who was in charge of the US Department of Education, she herself was the least likely person to be able to run it very well. Because if you want someone in charge of public education in the US, First of all, you want someone who went to public schools, which she didn't. She went to private schools. She went to Christian schools and she's a billionaire, okay? She's completely out of touch with the school system. And she has been hammering away at it and trying to undermine public schools the whole four years she had that uh, position. And finally, the last, the last uh, stroke, was when the COVID money started coming in, she, she distributed it in a way that favored private schools, charter schools, and disadvantaged public schools. Like the poorest of the poor kids should have gotten all the money, but they didn't. And they didn't even, you know, get their share of the money since public education covers 90% of the country's students, but that money, 90% of it didn't go to public schools. Then the voucher system also makes it hard. I mean, everything about her decisions made the rich richer and the poor poorer. And the biggest problem in a democracy is you don't want an entrenched or class. You don't want people who lack hope, who have lost hope, because the system is, is structured against them. So you always have to lift up the poor, and you always have to go the second mile to get them into the middle class. So then you have to lift up the next generation of poor people, but they're different than the previous one. Once you have an entrenched poor class, you have terrible problems. Um, so, so that was that's another issue and you can just eyeball that, but I do want you to know that the person in charge of public education was someone who really was unqualified and she used her position to constantly undermine public education. Um, then we go back to Aristotle's virtues and also Pope, the Pope. So his, he has the same philosophy as Martin Luther King, natural law theory, reject religious bigotry. So I would recommend that you look at this, the last page 13, is that page 13? Um, and then the, where the uh, science versus religion, some of all the issues that just keep getting brought up and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer where everybody's arguing about what would, you would call the cult, culture wars. So I don't know if you hear about this, but people will talk about the culture wars and how they're distracting us from figuring out how to create a middle class. Uh, they just, just, you know, distract people from focusing on what politicians actually can do, which is through taxes and regulations and policies and 
implementation, they can work on developing a middle class. But if you just have a culture war there, your people are going to not notice that. Um, all right. So I think, oh yeah, then going back over the news articles that I had you read on the Euthyphro, these again are about religion and um, religious bigotry. And um, Martin Luther King, again, was in favor of uniting reason and faith and um, getting rid of racism. And then since 9-11, we've had this problem with Islam and uh, Christianity that's tolerant and intolerant. And then Islam, branches of Islam that are tolerant versus intolerant. So once again, we will just keep going on these themes and why it's important to maintain our democracy to avoid polarization. And um, these articles are about people who do use religion to polarize Americans and to um, marginalize Muslim Americans. There are like 3.3 million Muslim Americans. And I don't think you want to alienate them. Um, so many Muslim Americans love America because the countries they came from are more authoritarian. They love freedom of religion. You know, they love uh, toleration and they're tolerant. Uh, but now that we've set up this animosity, um, more of our own Muslims um, can become less tolerant. They don't, they feel judged, they are judged, they're mistreated, and, um, you know, they're going to fight back. I hope they won't, but... Um, that's just not a way to treat your fellow citizens. So our founders, remember, in the town hall meeting, you treat people like equal, whether they're Muslim or not. And then in church, you do what you want, but don't bring that toxicity into the public square. Boy, they cared about that. We really need to think about that. Um, all right. So I will send this to you. It's uh, 2.15. I got to get to bed. Uh, okay, I'll see you tomorrow.